everybody, and welcome to the second of our two recorded sessions for the topic of the 1980s and 1990s. Um, in our previous session, we looked a little bit about the 1980s, some of the issues with Reagan's presidency um, in terms of economics, in terms of some of the changes that it influences in American politics at the time, um, and then going forward. And then also got into the 1990s in terms of some of the political kinds of divisions between the Republicans and Democrats during the contract with America and things like that. And then finished up with a little bit of a conversation about um, the, the kind of sensation, at least, that the 1990s opens a period of much more violence in the United States. Um, in some ways, that's more perception than it is reality. Um, but there are certainly going to be aspects of that that will sort of carry over and, and ripple effects of that that will carry over into the 2000s and the 2000s as, excuse me, as well. Um, and so today's session, we're going to wrap up the 80s and 90s and then sort of push a little bit into the 2000s as well. As I mentioned in the opening to the last recording, this is getting into material that is a little bit tricky in the sense of how much can we say that this is sort of historically relevant given how recent it is. We don't have a lot of opportunity to build sort of a, um, a long view of these issues, of, of these historical events, and use that long view to really understand how all the pieces fit together. And so that can be a little tough sometimes. We can definitely see some of the cause and effects, um, but it can be a little harder than it might be to be able to, you know, look back at the revolution or look back at World War II or those kinds of things and, and be able to see all of the different kinds of consequences that might grow out of a particular historical event. So what we're going to get into now then um, in the first place is the issue of diversity. As the country goes through the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, there is a growing amount of diversity throughout the United States population, whether that's because of larger numbers of people entering the country to pursue education or in search for jobs. Um, and then also beyond that, this gradual process by which formerly minority populations or current minority populations um, gain greater opportunities, greater advantages, um, greater levels of success in the economy and in politics and that sort of thing. And during this time, we also see then that development become manifested in more minority candidates for office, and then more minorities serving in um, higher and higher levels of political office. So whether that is mayors in major American cities, whether that is governors in American states, um, whether that is in Congress, we can begin to see numbers that reflect um, a long overdue kind of growth um, in those developments. And so you have African Americans emerging into political office in um, mayor's offices. You have them emerging into positions of governorships throughout the country beginning in the very late 1980s. Um, and then you also start to see increasing numbers of minorities appearing in Congress um, and also a growing representation among women. Uh, and so this is gonna be a long-term process the graphs and charts here give you a sense of uh, the involvement of women in Congress. That's the one on the left. So you can see women in the Senate, women in the House, gradually sort of growing beginning in the 90s and then much more dramatic kinds of expansion or, or increases in those numbers through the 2000s and 2010s. By the same token, the bar graph on the right shows the number of minority representatives in the House and the Senate, uh, representatives and senators in the Congress. This one only goes back to the year 2000, but you can see it's still uh, an, increasing, an increasing number, certainly. So whether you're looking at the black population, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, they are all seeing recognizable and noticeable increases 
as the decade wears on. And some of these kinds of things, the foundations for those, will have been laid in the 1980s and 1990s. So even though these charts focus primarily on later decades in some respects, a lot of those influences are really coming out of the 80s and 90s in particular. But this doesn't mean that this was all um, without its controversy. And we can see even today, right, that there are significant kinds of conversations and disillusionments in a lot of ways with growing minority involvement in politics and a sort of backlash that has developed on the part of certain white voters that feel that their traditional power base and their traditional powerful influence over politics and over the economy and over society is being eroded, right, by the growing presence of women or the growing presence of uh, racial or ethnic or religious minorities or um, otherwise formerly marginalized groups. And again, those things are not unique or exclusive to 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. These are things that we can see precedents for in some respects going back into earlier parts of the 20th century and all the way up into the 1990s. So Proposition 187 is a good example. There are also conversations in the late 1980s and into the 90s about the question of English as a national language, whether it should be made an official national language or not. Lots of, of criticism of the fact that, well, when I call the bank now, they ask if I want a, my phone call to be done in Spanish. And we live in the United States, so why should there be Spanish-speaking people here, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And so these kinds of concerns really reflect those broader social cultural issues of a sensation that traditional white privilege is being undermined. Proposition 187 connected the issue of sort of white privilege with the issue of, of quote-unquote illegal immigrants. And that proposition was a law that would have temporarily removed access to social programs that served illegal immigrants. The argument was California citizens and residents and taxpayers shouldn't be responsible for paying for services for people that live in the state but don't pay taxes and are not official U.S. citizens. This is a law that goes into effect, but it doesn't really last very long. It's one that the courts overturn, and when it goes up for a vote once again, um, it is not successful. And so California politics end up sort of scuttling the idea of another version of Proposition 187. But in 1994, when it is on the books, when it is being proposed, definitely, excuse me, definitely makes national headlines uh, and is something that is a very good example of these kinds of conversations and debates and, and disagreements over the nature of not just federal or state government actions in, in social programs, but also questions over immigration, questions over um, citizenship, and, and that sort of thing. By the 1990s, there's also a growing critique of affirmative action. Um, affirmative action is the idea that businesses or schools or um, a variety of different kinds of, of um, industries or, or services should in some ways prioritize the hiring or the admission of minority populations in order to increase the percentages and increase the opportunities for groups in certain populations to have access to higher education or to have access to um, certain jobs or that kind of thing. It becomes very heavily criticized in the 1990s and into the 2000s. Um, again, the concern among a lot of whites is this is undermining the ability for, for whites to maintain some of that privilege. There is certainly a legitimate concern that people of potentially 
sort of subpar qualifications might gain admittance to a, to a university or might be hired for a position over somebody who was more qualified and maybe they got that because of their race or because of their ethnicity or because of their gender or veteran status or disability or what have you. So there are certainly some, some reasonable kinds of arguments and points to be made in this, um, but there are also some issues that, that relate these kinds of questions to more fundamental kinds of issues in terms of race relations that have existed in the United States for you know, centuries, to be honest. The 1990s and 2000s also see a, um, a deepening divide in what's known as the culture wars. And some of this has to do with the emergence of women as equal forces economically and politically and socially. Things like Roe versus Wade, which is the decision in 1973 whereby the Supreme Court um, officially kind of legalizes abortion, guarantees a woman's right to choose abortion. This is going to cut a wedge through the American population and it becomes a representation of deeper kinds of cultural divisions that go beyond the simple question of abortion versus pro-life. And it is in many ways an example of a growing kind of conservatism that is focused more on questions of morality as opposed to, or interpretations of morality, as opposed to questions of economics or um, the size of the government. So for a long, long time, the conservatives in America tended to be focused more on issues of the government's role in American society and in the American economy, questions of foreign affairs, questions of economic um, regulation or economic freedoms. And by the 1970s and 80s in particular, and then especially into the 2000s and 2010s, those kinds of emphases among Republicans and conservatives start to take a back seat to questions of moral considerations and sort of defining the divide in American politics increasingly not by policy concerns so much as questions of gun control, um, abortion, these kinds of things. And so those quote unquote family values increasingly start to form this line of battle between the left and the right to the point that more and more and more often political conversations end up boiling down to issues that aren't really substantive, aren't really policy based. They're more based on different interpretations of the role of especially Christianity in sort of defining the American political scene and, and that sort of thing. And so this then does in some ways kind of bleed into the way that the United States perceives its role in world affairs. Um, during the Bush administration from 2001 to 2009, the United States has this kind of, in some ways, sort of schizophrenic uh, relationship with the world. On the one hand, the U.S. sort of steps back from some of its responsibilities of, or it's not responsibilities, some of its commitments to international relations, whether that is arms control, whether that is questions of the world court, whether that is questions of aspects of what we would call otherwise sort of moral leadership in the world. While at the same time, the United States chooses to undertake fairly significant kinds of international actions without developing any kind of consensus or without developing any kind of um, collaboration, right? Engaging in unilateral or, or at most maybe bilateral kinds of actions where the U.S. takes a position 
enacts that position by itself or potentially enacts a position with maybe one ally um, on board. And so this is in some ways a, um, a great departure from the way that administrations under, say, Clinton or even then in the, in the 2000 and teens under Obama um, sort of undertook international actions or international affairs. And probably the, the clearest example of that is in the war on terror. And so as a result of the September 11th attacks, the administration undergoes a fairly profound kind of, um, I don't want to say a change so much as it is a, an emphasis on a particular approach to rhetoric and action that perceives the world very much in similar terms as those used during the Cold War in the sense that this is an us versus them kind of arrangement. That there are evil entities in the world that need to be obliterated in order for the United States to secure its, its borders and secure its safety. And so these kinds of considerations and these kinds of questions are going to increasingly dominate the Bush administration in particular in terms of assigning responsibility for the disruption or instability in world affairs and then using America's military power, diplomatic power, economic power and influence um, to pressure change in one way or the other. So sometimes this is internal by things like the Patriot Act, which greatly expands the government's ability to um, sort of look in on people's communications and look in on people's records as a way to um, sort of review the possibility of people inside the United States operating in connection or conjunction with terrorist organizations or terrorist related nations. Um, in also the case of the United States invading Iraq uh, in 2003, which is an action that was in many ways done almost entirely just the United States and Great Britain. Virtually no other world power agrees to participate. And so these, these sort of rhetorical and, and actionable kinds of developments in the 2000s also contribute to the kind of culture war um, divisions that exist in the United States today, right? The, the suggestion that, well, America love it or leave it sort of thing, the, um, the really sort of unpleasant kinds of, of stereotyping and unpleasant kinds of um, name calling, right, on, on both sides of the political divide that in many ways are an outgrowth of those, those in some respects, unrelated, otherwise unrelated historical events, but certainly they are a, a piece of the puzzle that ultimately fit together to connect into the kinds of really venomous sorts of, of political polemic that, that exist in the United States today. So that is the end of the 80s and 90s material. Uh, make sure that if you've got questions, you let me know, get in touch with me, shoot me an email, whatever. Make sure that you're looking over the full PowerPoints so that you have all of the content from the section, not just the material that's in the recordings themselves. If you've got questions about anything, please feel free to um, get those to me. In the meantime, I hope you're all doing really, really well, and I will see everybody soon.